My name is George Saris. I'm the narrator of the Holy Bible New International Version that you can listen to on BibleGateway.com and author of the book Heaven's Doors, Wider Than You Ever Believed, which was awarded the Silver Medal in Theology in the 2018 Illumination Book Awards for Exemplary Christian Literature. St. Anselm defined God as that being than which none greater can be conceived. I think it's a pretty good definition. And as I think about it, I can conceive of a God who is all-powerful, all-wise, and good. I can conceive of a God whose power is irresistible, whose love is unconditional, and who never gives up on any of those he created in his image. I can conceive of a God before whom every knee will one day freely and joyfully bow, and every tongue will one day freely and joyfully confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I can conceive of a God who will one day restore all of his creation to the perfection he initially wanted, so that at the end of time he will once again look out on all that he has made and declare that it is very good. One of the most common responses I receive to those who hear that I believe in this ultimate restoration of all things is, oh, I sure wish that were true. But, <laughs> although they would never admit it, what they're actually saying is, deep down inside, I wish God were different. I wish he were more loving or wiser or more powerful than he is. Although they would never admit it, what they're actually saying is, I can conceive of a God who is greater than the one I worship. But I'm forced to believe in this lesser God because of what I've been told the Bible teaches. My purpose today is to address some of the teachings of Scripture that have been misinterpreted, misunderstood, and misrepresented, to show that what most people have been told the Bible teaches about the duration of hell is not true. My purpose today is to show that the God of the Bible is truly that being than which none greater can be conceived. As we begin looking at passages of the Bible about divine judgment and hope, it would seem appropriate to begin by asking, what is hell? That word has been defined in different ways down through the centuries, from a place of literal fire, to a kingdom of darkness ruled by the devil and his demons, to what is the most common definition today as separation from God. But for most people holding to the traditional view, two components are primary. First, hell is a place or condition of conscious misery. And second, that misery will never, ever, 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 ever end. I say that a little dramatically because in my experience, most Christians today have never really thought through the implications of what they say they believe. Punishment for sin is not the issue. We see sin punished all the time in this life, and God has made it clear that there is punishment in the age or ages to come. But punishment that never ends is a completely different matter. It brings to mind cruel tyrants who torture subjects who don't do their bidding. Endless, conscious misery is the most horrific thing you could possibly imagine. And if you really believed it was true, you would be weeping almost every moment of every day over the fate of those who are lost, especially those you know personally. So what are some of the passages of Scripture that we've been told clearly teach that some people, or more often, most people, will experience everlasting conscious torment in hell? The passage most often pointed to as the clearest statement in the entire Bible that hell is endless, is Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. In that verse, Jesus says, the wicked will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. That sounds pretty clear. The punishment referred to is eternal, so it must be endless, right? Well, actually, no. The first thing to point out in this passage is that the Greek word Ion, here translated as eternal or everlasting or forever in various versions of the Bible, does not mean never ending. It actually means the end is not known. It refers to a period of time, 
longer or shorter, past or future, the boundaries of which are concealed, obscure, unseen, or unknown. It's a word that you would use if you were standing on a beach looking out toward the horizon. From that perspective, it seems like the ocean goes on forever. But of course it doesn't. There is a shoreline out there somewhere. It's just that when you're standing on a beach looking out, you don't know where that shoreline is. From that standpoint, the place where the ocean ends is unknown. That word is used in numerous places in the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament that Jesus and the apostles quoted from, where it regularly refers to things that have or will come to an end. For example, after Jonah ran away from God and was swallowed by the great fish, he had a change of heart and decided to pray. In his prayer, he tells how long he expected to be imprisoned. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. Jonah didn't know how long his situation would last. In this case, forever turned out to be three days and was followed by his release. In many places in the Old Testament, the sacrifices and offerings made by the priests were said to be eternal statutes. Items such as the pure olive oil for the lamps, the garments for Aaron and his sons, and the sin, burnt, and peace offerings. But those statutes didn't last forever, and they were never intended to last forever. The Old Testament sacrificial system was designed to be superseded one day by the new covenant in Christ. A second argument made by those who believe that Matthew 25, 46 teaches endless punishment was first suggested by St. Augustine, who, by the way, didn't read Greek. He said, For Christ, in the very same passage, included both punishment and life in one and the same sentence. If both are eternal, it follows necessarily that either both are to be taken as long-lasting but finite, or both as endless and perpetual. Is that true? If an adjective is used twice in the same sentence, must it necessarily mean the same thing each time? Again, the answer is no. For example, if Goliath had fought David in front of Mount Everest, a person could honestly say, a tall man is standing in front of a tall mountain. But no one would think that the man and the mountain are the same size. The adjective tall derives its meaning from what it refers to. In the first instance, to a man, in the second, to a mountain. In Matthew 25, 46, the adjective Jesus used refers to two completely different things, life and punishment. Eternal life is divine life that comes from God. That divine life never ends. Eternal punishment is divine punishment from his hand, the duration of which may certainly be temporary, lasting as long as is necessary until it accomplishes its purpose. Third, if we take the time to look at the context of what Jesus is actually talking about in Matthew 25, 46, we'll make an amazing discovery. Jesus' statement occurs at the end of a discourse that he gives privately to his disciples, extending all the way from Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, to the verse we're looking at, chapter 25, verse 46. The question that prompts the entire talk is, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the ion? The same word that's translated as eternal in the verse that we're looking at. The Greek word ion in Matthew 25, 46 cannot mean endless because the ion in question has an end. Another of the passages most often cited to support the idea that the Bible teaches endless punishment is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. Most Bible versions say that the rich man is in hell. He's described as being in torment and agony in this fire. A great chasm has been fixed between the rich man and Lazarus, and those who want to cross over the chasm cannot. That sounds pretty convincing. However, if we look closer at the passage, a few things bring that interpretation into question. First of all, the rich man was not in hell. He was in Hades, 
And Revelation chapter 20, verse 13, specifically says that Hades will one day give up the dead who are in it. Second, this is a parable, a fictional story designed to teach a spiritual truth. What Jesus did was similar to what a modern speaker would do if he were making reference to a book like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. He could clearly make some very important truths about life in this world without putting a stamp of approval on the existence of talking animals in another world. The audience for this parable was made up of tax collectors and sinners who were spiritually poor yet recognized their need for God. And Pharisees and teachers of the law who were materially rich and yet had deceived themselves into thinking that they were favored by God. Like the rich man in the parable, those religious leaders were actually clothed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. The point of the parable is that those rich religious leaders wouldn't repent even if one were to rise from the dead. Third, the parable was told before the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Neither Abraham, nor the rich man, nor Lazarus could do anything to make it possible to go from one side of the chasm to the other. That was the purpose of Jesus' death and resurrection. Christ bridged the chasm. It's often said that Jesus spoke of hell more than any of the other New Testament writers. That claim is actually true, but it's also not true at the same time. The claim is based on the number of times that Jesus used the Greek word Gehenna, the term most commonly translated as hell in modern versions of the Bible. Gehenna is used 12 times in the New Testament. 11 of those times it's used by Jesus himself. The other use is in the book of James. So if we're looking at how many times Jesus used a particular word that is translated hell compared to how many times others in the New Testament use that same word, we'd be correct in saying that Jesus spoke of hell more often than any of the other New Testament writers. However, the real issue is not how many times Jesus used a particular word. The real issue is what Jesus meant when he used it and what his listeners understood when they heard it. What comes to your mind when you hear the word Auschwitz? In the future, it's possible that the word will take on a more metaphorical meaning. But right now, while the actual place still exists as a museum and in the memories of some who knew it firsthand, it reminds us of the repulsion, shame, and horrible deaths experienced by those who suffered in Nazi concentration camps in World War II. Like Auschwitz in our day, the Gehenna that Jesus spoke of was an actual place that people could visit. It had been associated with child sacrifice in the past and was then most likely used as the common dump of the city. The corpses of the worst criminals were flung into it unburied. Its stench was stifling. Fires were lit to purify the contaminated air. And it spoke to Jesus and his listeners of repulsion, shame, and horrible death. Instead of experiencing honor, like their ancestors whose bodies were treated reverently when they died, those cast into Gehenna would experience the immense dishonor associated with being disposed of in a dump to become an object of scorn for the masses. In an honor-shame culture like that of the ancient and even modern Near East, that would be a fate worse than death. Solomon expressed very well the thought that would be in the minds of the religious leaders who listened to Jesus talk. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, but no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive a proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. Gehenna was definitely a place of judgment, but it was a judgment on earth. One of the greatest fears that Christians have had down through the centuries is that they've somehow committed the unpardonable sin, a sin so serious that the person who commits it can never be forgiven and must spend eternity in conscious torment in hell. The fear is based on a comment Jesus made when he healed a demon-possessed man. Instead of seeing what Jesus did as a true miracle of God, 
Some of the religious leaders accused him of being possessed by the devil, having an unclean spirit, and driving out demons by using the power of the devil himself. Mark records Jesus' response with these words, I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. Those are strong words for sure, and they definitely give the impression that this is a very serious sin. However, if we look carefully at what Jesus is saying, the first thing to note is that except for the sin against the Holy Spirit, Jesus says that all the blasphemies and sins of men will be forgiven them. This clearly implies a great hope for the possibility of an ultimate restoration for all those who do not accuse Jesus of being possessed by the devil, having an unclean spirit, and doing his miracles by the power of the devil. The second thing that we should be aware of is that the word never in this passage is not in the Greek text. Jesus did not say the person will never be forgiven. He actually said, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come, as it reads in Matthew. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is attributing God's work to Satan. It's saying no to God. Obviously, as long as that continues, nothing can be done. It's impossible for someone to experience God's forgiving grace when that person won't accept it, whether that takes place in this age, the age to come, or in one of the ages to come. However, if hell is a place designed to bring people to a place where they recognize their need for God's saving grace in Christ, when they stop resisting and truly repent, then God's forgiveness is granted and heaven's doors are opened. Jesus was once asked a very pointed question about how many people will ultimately be in heaven. Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He answered the question with a parable to encourage his listeners to make every effort to enter the narrow door. Once the door is closed, many will try to enter in, but will be unable. They will knock and plead, but won't be let in. The result will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when they see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets sitting in a feast in the kingdom of God, but they themselves are thrown out. Unfortunately, the question phrased in most translations gives a completely different sense from the question that was actually asked. The wording in the original Greek is, Lord, are they few in number, those who are being saved? It wasn't a question about how many people would ultimately be saved. It was a question about the number of people at that time who were accepting the message that Jesus brought. The kingdom of God is not only a future reality. It's a kingdom that Jesus began to establish while he was here on earth. In a similar passage in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus encouraged his listeners to enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. As with many places where Jesus talks about life, he was not addressing the afterlife in this passage. Jesus was talking about pursuing a truly meaningful and productive life in the here and now. That life is actually found by comparatively few people. By contrast, there are many unproductive avenues in life that are broad, easy to follow, and well-traveled. You simply need to look around at all the trivial things that people pursue. The biggest house, the newest car, the whitest teeth, most Facebook friends, latest iPhone to see the truth of that statement. The book of Hebrews has some very sobering words about those who have backslidden their faith. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance. Because to their loss, 
they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. If it's impossible for someone who's fallen away to be brought back to repentance, are we not forced to conclude that they can never ultimately be restored? No. The word impossible here has the same force as that which Jesus said to his disciples when he told them that it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. In response to their question, who then can be saved? Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The writer of Hebrews is saying that it's impossible for people to bring back someone who has fallen away and thus subjected Jesus to public disgrace. But it's not impossible for God to restore that individual. These words in Hebrews would seem to apply to the apostle Peter, and it certainly may have been on Peter's mind after he denied Christ three times. He had once been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and he had fallen away and subjected Jesus to public disgrace. The other disciples tried to restore Peter with their words. However, it wasn't until Jesus himself came and spoke directly to Peter, asking him three times if he loved him, that Peter was restored. The last judgment passage that we'll look at relates directly to the fate of the wicked after they die. The wicked will be cast into the lake of fire. We're told that the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. We're also informed that the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That definitely sounds like something horrendous beyond description. But the words in their original language give a much different picture of what the purpose of the lake of fire is than what is normally thought. The word translated sulfur originally referred to fire from heaven. It's connected with sulfur because it was used in pagan religious services for purification. Pre-Roman civilizations used it as a medicine, a fumigant, a bleaching agent, and as an incense. And the Romans used sulfur or the fumes from its combustion as an insecticide and to purify a sick room and cleanse its air from evil. The terms translated torment originally referred to the action of an inspector who was testing the quality of something, as with good versus forged money. In its proper sense, it's a means of testing and proving. For the Apostle John, who authored the book of Revelation, and for his readers in the ancient world, the lake of fire was a refiner's fire, not a place of unending torture that had no purpose other than to inflict pain. Its purpose was to purify and cleanse from evil in the age to come. God is good, and all his punishments have a good purpose. Now that we've looked at some of the judgment passages in Scripture and seen that they do not teach endless punishment, it's time to look at passages in the Bible that give hope that one day all those God created in his image will experience the peace and joy of being with him in his presence. The best place for us to start is by looking at who the Bible says Jesus Christ is and why he came. The angel who appeared to the shepherds on that glorious night to announce the birth of the promised Messiah did not say, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for some of the people, or even for most of the people. The angel said, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. That message was made clear by John the Baptist when he revealed who Jesus was. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
the people in the Samaritan town of Sychar, after spending two days with Jesus, said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. That understanding was acknowledged by the Apostle John in his first epistle, when he told his readers, We have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. According to the Bible, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. He's not just the Savior of part of the world. When Jesus spoke to the crowd around Zacchaeus, he told them, The Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Did Jesus succeed in his mission? Or will the vast majority of the lost never be found? When speaking to the crowd after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus said, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Was Jesus telling the truth when he said that? Was he exaggerating what he would actually accomplish? The Apostle Paul explained to his readers in Corinth that as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. He told Timothy, This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. And the Apostle John told his readers that Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Were Paul and John, like Jesus, guilty of dramatically overstating what God would accomplish in Christ? No. Jesus came to redeem the whole world. The Bible teaches quite clearly that God wants to save all mankind. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And Peter told his readers, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The Bible also clearly teaches that God is able to save all mankind. He is the all-powerful Lord of creation, who accomplishes everything He intends to do. There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. The Lord does whatever pleases Him, in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and in all their depths. I know that you can do all things, no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Nothing is impossible with God. Third, God will save all mankind. A few years ago, I was in a polite discussion with a theologian who believed that God wants to and is able to save everyone. But he thought he won't necessarily do so because he's given mankind a free will. This theologian thought that it was necessary to leave open the possibility that some people may choose to resist God throughout eternity. I explained that I agreed that it was theoretically possible, but that Scripture had revealed that that won't happen, because God has shown us what the end will be. The Apostle Paul told his readers in Philippi what will happen at the end of time. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this is not forced submission. It is freely given. Every use in the New Testament of the word translated confess in this passage connotes voluntary confession, to freely, openly, wholeheartedly acknowledge or give praise. God doesn't force praise from vanquished enemies, and He doesn't accept hypocritical or feigned praise. 
At the very end of the last book of the Bible, we learn of a glorious city that has come down from heaven, filled with beauty that is beyond description. We are told that the gates of the city are always open. The fruit of the tree of life is always available. Its leaves are for the healing of the nations. And at that time, there will no longer be any curse. Then Jesus himself says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. So who are those outside the city who are invited to wash their robes and go through the gates into the city? They're the same ones who just a few verses earlier were said to have their place in the lake of fire. Like the prodigal son, they are living outside the blessing of their father. Why? Because those who are ungodly and impure are not allowed to enter through any of the gates of the city while they remain in that state. But God doesn't give up on them. In the New Jerusalem where all this takes place, an invitation is given. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. The Bride is the body of believers throughout history who are already in the New Jerusalem. They don't need to wash their robes and eat of the tree of life because they have already done so. They're already in the city. The Spirit and the Bride are calling to those in the lake of purifying fire outside the gates. Ultimate restoration is based on the fact that the God of heaven, that being than which none greater can be conceived, is good. He is not partial, favoring some over others. He does not change, acting graciously toward sinners while they're alive on earth, but withdrawing his hand of mercy after death. He's not cruel, able to save all, but choosing rather to consign most of the human race to endless conscious suffering. And he's not weak, desiring to save all, but ultimately powerless to do so. The true teaching of the Bible is that hell is real, but it doesn't last forever. Evil will not remain a part of God's creation forever. At the end of time, all those created in His image will enjoy the peace and joy of being in His presence. Jesus Christ succeeded in His mission to seek and save what was lost.